Hello and welcome to the Digital Health Cast, a podcast where we showcase healthcare pioneers innovating modern day medicine. I'm your host, Dr. Mwata Dyson. I'm pleased to have with us today joining the show, Rachel Chassie. Rachel is the Director of Innovation at the Digital Medicine Society, a professional organization whose mission is to advance the safe, effective, ethical, and equitable use of digital medicine to optimize health. Rachel, I want to thank you for joining us today. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. It's my pleasure. Um, You know, I can't wait to dive in and talk more about the Dime Society and to kind of pick your brain about digital medicine. Um, But given that the digital medicine marketplace has really exploded recently, um, and there's a number of contributing factors, right, from the high uses of cell phones uh, during the pandemic, there's been a rapid adoption of telehealth services, and there's just a really big influx of companies now enter into this ecosystem. So a lot of uh, key trends kind of driving the market forward. But I'm really curious about what drives you or led you to wanting to be in this particular field and join the Dime Society. Yeah, thanks. So that's right. Uh, Just recently, so we are recording this in early 21. um, But through, as we all know, through 2020, it was quite quite a year for many kinds of reasons. Um, And it did see quite an explosion in sort of the need to um, advance digital medicine products to really uh, together optimize human health. Um, And so what really brought me here in the first place interested in digital medicine, um, kind of a a different journey through research as well. So, you know, my my background begins, uh, I guess my story begins working in research where it was looking at um, the effects of um, ad- attitude and decision-making research, primarily how does um, religion m- mediate prejudice. And so kind of looking at that was really some interesting stuff that showed me how cool science actually is and how you can measure things that perhaps um, seem abstract but can be done in really unique ways. And so from that brought me to working um, in a space with um, patients directly in Alzheimer's and dementia research. And from that, I was really fortunate and really humbled to work directly with patients and their families. I remember specifically working with some families um, who, uh, with a genetic a condition that had some early signs where people would be losing or uh, it would show up in their 40s and 50s and some of those first signs would be changes in personality. So it's, by the time that they got this diagnosis of dementia, they were, they had already, you know, their family had left them, those kinds of things. And so seeing patients and their families in, in these true states, uh, especially with, you know, being so open with, with their experiences, it really led me to realize that there's a lot of good to do in healthcare and just can't turn our back on families and patients. And so that kind of solidified me advocating for patients. What brought me to the digital world happened to be um, a job of mine. And another job of mine after that was working with a, a large pharma in Cambridge, Mass, um, specifically hired into the digital medicine group there. And so from that, it really opened my eyes into what the future of healthcare is. Um, without a doubt, it is more towards digital. And I do believe that in the future, we're going to drop the digital in digital medicine, and it'll simply be synonymous with medicine. But seeing what it is, it's not only is it fascinating, but for me, it was really a way to deliver healthcare in a way that hadn't existed previously. And that excites me because I see digital medicine, if done well and intentionally, to be a way to deliver healthcare to groups who have been historically left behind before. And so that's part of uh, the mission of DIME, the Digital Medicine Society. And it's really exciting to see the work happening now and excited to see the, the future being charted as we speak. You know, that's a very interesting path that you ended up taking. You mentioned dementia and the work that you were doing uh, previously. And we think about now behavioral health as many of us have suffered some form of lockdown and the mental impact it can have. And to think about the timing of how you ended up transitioning into digital medicine and how now that being at the forefront of offering services and helping people to have better access uh, to to tools, you know, that helps them to cope with these type of situations, not knowing obviously years ago that we would have ever been in a situation that, you know, that we're in now. So uh, an amazing path, an amazing journey. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, digital medicine or, or working with the digital medicine company before coming and working with Dime, um, and I definitely want to get into learning more about the organization itself. 
But one of the things I was hoping you could help me clear up, um, there are a lot of terms uh, that are used and sometimes used interchangeably, probably erroneously. And I was wondering if you can kind of clarify it for us. Um, we hear terms like digital health as we use in the digital health cast title, um, digital medicine, digital therapeutics, and things like smart pills and smart devices. Can you help us to better understand uh, where does digital medicine fit in the realm of all these other terms? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, that's a great question and a very important one to begin any conversation in digital anything, right? So part of one of the first things that Dime did was we saw this exact same thing happening, right? So there would be conferences and people would be using the same similar phrases, but in different kinds of ways and in ways where, you know, that's not the best phrase to use. And so what we sought to do is one of the first things that Dime did. So we, we were founded in May 2019. And so one of the first things we put out was um, a, a post that was digital health, digital medicine, digital therapeutics. What's the difference, right? Let's level set here. And I'm happy to talk about what that is too. So I'll explain that talking about the differences between those three, digital health, digital medicine, and digital therapeutics, right? An, easier, an easy way to think about it is kind of like the, the level of evidence required um, to label a product as such, right? So let's start at the top, digital health. Right. Many things are digital health. So it can be an app on your on your smartphone that sort of measures the steps you take in a day. Right. So that's considered digital health because you can use that information to help you become, you know, be aware of your daily behavior. Maybe you can use that as inspiration to maybe live a healthier lifestyle. But let me contrast it with what digital medicine is to help uh, distinguish between the two. Whenever you take a step down, health at the top and in the middle is digital medicine, that step down drills down to the level of evidence required to be determined digital medicine. So this specifically means that a digital medicine product is one that um, needs to be regulated. So for example, whenever I use that, that app on your smartphone that kind of tracks your steps, that doesn't need to go through the FDA, it's not making any type of healthcare claim, right? But if it was to be used um, for digital medicine purposes for a different manner, then that could be used for digital, digital medicine. So an example you can use, it's not just what a product is, but the intention of a product that makes a difference. So an example would be, let's just do a smartwatch, right? Pick any, any smartwatch that you like. Everyone's got a favorite manufacturer. <laughs> right. I won't be specific and pick them, but let's imagine one, right? Okay. This smartwatch can be used for both digital medicine and digital health depending on what it does for you. So if you wear this smartwatch really just to keep track of your workout, you know, what was your heart rate during your, 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 your bike ride this morning, use the same watch that's digital health. But if you use that same watch in a different way to actually, you know, provide information to your healthcare provider, to, to, to be part of your, um, you know, to integrate into your, your medical record in ways that are much more robust, um, then that requires, that's, that's, that's the difference too for digital medicine. So that's kind of a difference there. So one is regulated, one is not. That's kind of a high level way. And let's also talk about digital therapeutics. All right, so if we're using that same analogy or at the top is digital health, one step down is digital medicine, one step down is digital therapeutics because we're going down because it requires the highest level of, of um, clinical evidence and it's also sent to the FDA, right? So a digital therapeutic is one where the digital product is the one that provides a therapy directly. An example of this that I think is really interesting came out of Achille recently. So they were recently um, approved by the FDA to deliver a ADHD intervention through a video game, right? Mm -hmm. So that video game is considered a, ther a digital therapeutic because it offers um, actually care through that digital product. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm glad you were here to uh, clarify those differences and help us out. Uh, so let's jump in and let's talk about, you know, the Dime Society and let's start learning more about, you know, the great work that you guys are doing over there. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the Dime Society? Yeah, sure. Thanks. So Dime, we are the first and only um, professional society for the big field of digital medicine. You did a fantastic job with our mission statement, and I appreciate that. And so we are focused on advancing the safe, effective, ethical, and equitable use of digital, digital medicine products to advance human health. But what also that means specifically is who, who we are. 
right? So we're a professional society for anyone in the field. So we include, we uh, welcome anyone from software developers to hardware developers to VC funders to payers to regulators from big pharma or um, tech startups. So the whole gamut, all kinds of people. And one of, one of the things that I'm most proud of for Dyne is we also um, allow patients to join us. Not only do we allow patients to join, but we encourage their same participation along with anyone else. So we don't kind of make a difference between, you know, we don't have hierarchies about which patient, which, uh, which members have more, more say. We, we do believe that the best way to advance um, uh, digital medicine is to do it in a conversation with all collaborators um, that we can bring to the table as possible. And that's, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah. So, you know, I also learned throughout talking more with patients through my work with Dime that a lot of patients aren't kind of allowed to join other different kinds of medical societies, which I right. find to be a shame. You know, we do a lot of talking about patients, but not a lot of talking with patients. And so, you know, some of what we do at Dime is we've partnered with um, our friends at Savvy Cooperative to really help kind of bring in patient engagement strategies that are really useful for the development and deployment of digital medicine products, for example. Um, so, so that's part of what we do. Uh, and so what we do specifically is, you know, we are a, a professional society made for and by people who are doing the work now, right? So whenever we're doing our day-to-day -day tasks at our jobs, you know, what, what, would, what are the things that the field needs to get the work done now, to get it done in a way that creates it, that sets it up for success in the future and is, actually, is truly actionable items? So some of the things that we do is we have um, frameworks to, uh, for use. So one example is um, our, what we call our V3 framework. So it's a, a verification, clinical validation, software verification. So what it does is an example for, you know, how um, companies can build their products in a way um, that's actionable. You can take it to your team right now and go through it and go through those steps and do it. Something else too is what we call the playbook. So these are all freely accessible um, products too, because we are a nonprofit. So everything we do is freely accessible. Um, and so I, I like to return again to our playbook. So this is um, an industry guide about the creation of wearable devices in a way that looks at looks at throughout the entire gamut of development. So we we touch on things like patient engagement, ethics. Um, clinical validation, things like that, that's, that's available right now for teams to use to help guide um, the development of these kinds of products. You offered a lot of insight there. Um, I want to go back to the patient-centeredness because healthcare at its core should be centered around the patients and rarely is it. That's, they typically come in as the probably the last key stakeholder um, once the product is completely finished. So I'm, I'm trying to visualize the their input and how it works on a particular project or within the framework itself as they're integrating with um, this dynamic interdisciplinary group of experts. Are there uh, any examples, like you mentioned patient experience, um, and maybe this was surrounding some research and some product and looking at the efficacy, but are there any um, specific examples that you could share that helps us to better understand the dynamic and how all these moving pieces work together within the community? I think that it is necessary to bring in patient involvement from the very beginning of the development of a digital medicine product. Frankly, your product will probably fail if you don't bring in um, patient experience from the very beginning. And a, a way that can be done is whenever you are setting, you know, timelines or a budget for d the development of any kind of digital medicine product, it can be a software, it can be an app, it can be a wearable, um, build in budget to talk with patients, build in different ways in the development pathway to get patient feedback. Because it's too late if your product is already on the market, and that's the only time you get patient feedback is in commercial. Um, at that point, you've created something that it's hard to fix on the back end. You really lift out a you left, left out the key stakeholder, right? We're trying, we're all doing this to improve patients' lives. But if we never ask patients, one, would you even use this? Does this work? Is this comfortable? Would you use this? Would your mother use this? Those kinds of things, and we're really missing out um, from from the power of what these products can be. I'm, uh, you know, I was thinking about just terms in general um, as we're trying to differentiate uh, like digital health and 
digital medicine and digital therapeutics, like we spoke about earlier. And it had me thinking about um, something you said earlier about digital medicine, maybe one day just being medicine, right, and being able to drop the digital. It had me thinking about the term modern medicine and how that term was first adopted um, after the Industrial Revolution and 300 years later, we're still calling it modern, right? There are a lot of obvious problems with the traditional modern medical system. But what are some of the challenges that you've seen with the digital society that maybe the society and the community itself are trying to address? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I've got two responses. Um, hopefully I can stay on track and address both of them. So yeah, one, no, please do. <laughs> yeah, so one is just a general problem that all technology has. And that is earning the trust of consumers. So that is not something that is distinct to digital medicine. We see it in our online banking apps. You know, there's always something that happens where all of a sudden you find out that your favorite app or product is selling your data and information in ways that you did not know, right? So, you know, one of the, the um, problems that cannot be ignored through digital medicine, and this is the same through any kind of um, technology that's used with consumers, is sort of the lack of trust. Um, technology has done a really poor job earning the trust of consumers, of patients, of you and me, right? And so in order for there to be proper adoption of digital medicine products and really any technology, trust has to be earned um, from the society. You know, and so one of the ways that Dime um, takes a look at this is we do some work about what's required for privacy, right? Especially whenever we look at the very beginning of um, the pandemic, there was a lot of apps that were trying to collect a lot of information, you know, and uh, uh, there's contact tracing, those kinds of things too. And we saw a lot of um, altruism from people who were saying, yes, 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 here, take my data, let's solve this, this global healthcare crisis, let's do this together. But I'd also recommend um, to take a moment and to see how is that data going to be used. Your people are so kind and giving to help solve this horrible crisis. It would be a shame to take advantage of those people who are so willing to help, right? And so um, one of the things that we did was we did a, you know, just kind of a put up a red flag. Let's, hey, let's think about this, right? Let's, what are ways that we can do this together in order to earn trust? So that's part of the things that we weave in, out, in and out of um uh, dimes offerings like the playbook we have a whole a whole area on privacy and what that means and the fact that terms of service agreements is not the same as privacy right and so you know digital medicine has the um, obligation to look at privacy in a way that really does protect people and patients um you know in this in this new um you know, in this new uh, century, we're finding ourselves where patient protection is really getting to a place where that means data protection, really. So that's one that's one problem that I think that we all need to look at and solve together. Not just digital medicine, but any kind of technology. Something else, too, um, that cannot be um, ignored is health disparities that still, still persist. And I don't think I need to go through and talk about what those are. There are journals of publications of what, what they are, where they come from, but we do know they exist and shame on us for allowing them to, con to persist. So what does this mean for DIME? Why am I bringing this up, right? Well, it means a lot because if DIME wants to forward the ethical use of the next revolution in healthcare, which is the digital revolution, we need to do this right. We need to look at how our tools are and are not being used in ways that we intend, which is, providing health care for all, good health care for all or as many people as possible, right? And so technology has a unique opportunity to deliver health care in unique, different ways than ever before. But it's not a silver bullet, right? There's still something called the digital divide where some folks have access to Wi-Fi or digital products and other folks don't. There has to be work to fix that. We, we think this is important, right? And so we, we've put in a whole field, um, whole ethics chapter into our playbook um, to talk about how to do this intentionally, right? Um, and we're also working with also different groups too. So Dime loves collaboration. And so yes. one of the things that we've recently um, announced in the past week or so is our um, inclusion on what's called the HEAL Coalition. 
So this is, this HEAL stands for Health, Equity, and Access Leadership Coalition. And this is a coalition put together by our friends at the Consumer Technology Association and the Connected Health Institute. So what this, what the HEAL Coalition is, is any group that's using any technology for healthcare. So that includes um, uh, Best Buy Health, that includes Google, that includes Boston Children's, that includes Dime, that includes lots of folks. And what we're doing is working together to put forth ways we can develop these products to actually help people who have historically been left behind in healthcare. Because if we don't, shame on us. We've gone too far in this society, too far in healthcare to no longer care. We're out of excuses for leaving people behind. And so we're hoping with this new revolution, we can do our best to get it right and to get closer to getting it right and bringing justice and equity in healthcare for all. I believe this is where digital products could have the biggest outcomes, right? Um, in terms of like disparity, being able to get access to people, as you alluded to, they wouldn't have it before, whether it was due to the lack of insurance, whether it was just zip code, you know, where they happen to live at the particular moment. We're just getting access to some of these better uh, medical communities. You know, you and I spoke earlier that we live in urban communities that have very large medical centers. So it's an advantage that we have that other people could benefit from as well if they had some type of digital uh, bridge to connect them from where they lived and where these practitioners um, were residing. So I'm glad to hear that there's a specific focus on there because as you mentioned, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, in this area. Um, you know, I want to learn more about the community and to kind of get an idea. You said it was an interdisciplinary approach, but kind of from a high level view, just taking a look at many people who are already members, have you noticed an influx of any particular group in general, like say it's nurses or engineers, and maybe a group that you don't see as many people entering that maybe they need to start considering it? You know, I would always like to see more and more patients. We are very fortunate to have some really fantastic patient leaders and patient experts in our membership, but there's always room for more. And I wonder if it's because patients often don't feel welcomed in these kinds of communities or not. They're, patients can't really access a lot of different kinds of groups like this. We also offer, uh, even if people can access, the barrier to entry is really high. So one of the things that we do is we offer a, a free membership option um, for anyone. So that's, we built that primarily thinking of patients and their families, students too, because you know we need to bring all minds too. Um, and so um, we're always welcome to bring in more patients um, and so to sit on our live webinars, to sit on our journal clubs, to interact on our membership-wide Slack so that we're all a part of this conversation, right? I'm happy to see that there is an appetite for folks who want to bring in patient voices, um, but there's often maybe an artificial barrier, um, maybe that some product developers have to not access patients, right? So I'm always happy to see more patients. You can always take more. Even if we have thousands and thousands, we can always take a couple thousand more. <laughs> so that's a plug to any anyone who wants to join. Okay, you cool. Know. And they're coming in to these webinars as, as it sounds like active participants. That's right, yeah, so a seat at the table, right? Um, right? Some people kind of exist, you know, in a professional world where patients are never are never seen, are never welcomed. And so for our webinars to have, we have some fabulously wonderful, fabulously fierce patient advocates and patient experts who come to most of our live events and ask really great questions, you know, um, that I think would benefit all of us to learn from. And I always like whenever we get tough questions on those kinds of live events, because it really just makes us all better and broadens our understanding of things. Is digital medicine being regulated now by any governing body, much like uh, pharmaceuticals are, you know, by the FDA? Um, is there any oversight in that area? Yeah, it's a great question. So digital medicine products have always been regulated. And I'm going to talk to you from a U.S. standpoint. Um, so that I don't put my foot in my mouth talking about other different kinds of areas. So yes, so at the end of last year, the FDA created a Digital Health Center of Excellence specifically to build their uh, their chops at looking at applications for digital medicine products. 
So yes, um, there were before last year, before the end of last year, of course, there were lots of different applications that went to the FDA. And with this new form of healthcare, we're now all of a sudden talking about machine learning. We're now talking about algorithms, which are different than, say, the PK studies of the past that the FDA has always looked at. So, um, you know, big appreciation for the FDA for recognizing that like, hey, this is happening. This is big. We need to do we need to do something about it. So they created their Digital Health Center of Excellence for it to specifically have a whole department of folks who know um, the inner workings of what's required to build a competent um, AI system. And you know, to look at things like bias in these algorithms. Are they useful? Or are they not? Who's being left out of? And also to know how the difference between a typical drug product and say a combination product that uses a drug and a digital medicine product. There's a lot of similarities, but a lot of key differences. And it's important for regulating agencies to understand that. FCA has been fantastic and took that very seriously and have now built that. And I'm proud to say that the FDA has approached DIME to be um, part of our collaborative communities. Um, to Dime, uh, The FDA has asked DIME to help provide expertise in different kinds of areas whenever they see it. So um, the FDA, I feel like people will often give them a bad rap. From my experience with the FDA, they have high standards because they are, gosh darn it, going to make sure that the most safe and effective products are on the market for, for our for us, right? And so the FDA is doing a fantastic job really trying to um, do their best to look at these applications with um, with speed and with fairness and with um, uh, discernment. Um, in terms of um, the educational platform that you guys offer, uh, can you tell me a little bit more about these webinars? Are these webinars uh, something that you plan on putting on every month? Um, are they available for members only. Um, or if you can just elaborate a little bit more on that, I would love to hear more. Yeah, thanks. Great questions. I love this. Um, <laughs> sure. So we do kind of two, two monthly events um, overall. And I'll talk about those kind of in the same way because they're, they're under the same paradigm. And so that would be our webinars and our journal club. So these are monthly or mostly every month. I think we had maybe nine or 10 webinars in all of 2020. So maybe we miss a couple of months. We try and do monthly. Um, and so these are live events. And part of the, the beauty of our live events is that members who are live, they get to ask their questions live, either directly by unmuting themselves and asking in the Q&A portion or typing them in the chat function. This is a really fantastic opportunity because, you know, I mean, I'm thinking about what we did just in January of 2021. Gosh, I almost said 2019. Hot dog, time moves quickly. <laughs> That's because um, we all want to go back to 2019. So we all want to be there. <laughs> we all want to be there until we're on the other side of this pandemic. Then we're happy to move forward. Um, yeah, so, you know, we were really fortunate to get really fantastic guests um, and experts. So in um, January of 2021, we were very fortunate to host Megan Zweig, who is the chief operating officer of Rock Health. And so we featured her. Um, Rock Health put out a report looking at um, the diversity of digital health leadership um, looking at 2020. So they did, a, they did a, a landscape analysis setting a benchmark about what leadership looks like um, for both for managers and above the digital medicine space. So it, what people were um, uh, self-selecting by giving their demographics. So we have information about ethnicity, we have information about where they live, how much funding, how they get funding, the differences their way and how that's stratified against different kinds of folks, right? So oh. um, Megan Zweig is fantastic. Her research is excellent. And so she was presenting that information too. And it really gave a great opportunity for, for folks to talk to, to Megan and to Rock Health about this. For example, on that webinar alone, we had a black founder who talked about yeah, um, my experience really does kind of match that, you know, their research showed that a lot of black founders have to bootstrap their companies and with much higher rates than white founders do, you know, and so his opportunity to connect with Megan and give more of a personal experience taught us all about what it's like to be to wear different kinds of shoes and also with a great connection um, for her to, you know, bring in that kind of voice whenever they do their next report. Um, and so take a step back to you kind of asked me a little bit about the logistics of our um, programming. So um, kind of two different things. Folks have to be a DIME member in order to participate live. Um, but we also have all of our recordings and our slide decks available 
freely on our website afterwards. So you don't have to be a member to look at our past events, but you have to be a member in order to participate for our live events. Okay, amazing. And, and you've given a lot of reasons why someone would want to be a member and to be there on the live show and interacting in real time. So um, that, that's amazing. You know, I know given the way 2020 ended, the way 2021 started, it's hard to try to think too far in advance, right? It's, uh, if we've learned anything, is to live in the moment. But where do you <laughs> see Dime Society heading in the next five or 10 years? Like any really high reaching goals where the organization itself is, is looking right now? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, yeah. Thinking further ahead, wow! Um, I think sometimes we really are, are kind of our head down, and we're just trying to trying to you know make progress now, see what we can do now. Um, but I think what we really you know I think one of my big dreams for for Dime in the next five or ten years is to take a beat and to look at what happened. Right? We've only been around. It will be. We will be. We will have been um, around for two years. Come May twenty twenty one. And even just thinking about what we've done in the past year, we just did our, our year kind of um, sort of review, retrospective. I mean, what we've done in the past year and a half already is extraordinary. All of our different publications, all of our different, um, you know, um, crowdsourced tools, which has just grown immensely. Incredible to think about what that would mean. I feel as though to be able to um, predict the future, especially for something like digital medicine, I would hate to have that said on a podcast to look back on this podcast in 10 years to see how small minded little baby Rachel was 10 years ago, right? But I do have dreams that we would look back on the work that we've done and be proud of it. Because yes, I'm proud of my work now, but are we proud of where we are in 10 years? Are we proud of the work that we've done with, say, for example, health disparities? Will we see the needle move? Because if we do not, then I will not be proud of this work as much as we could. Do we see um, better privacy standards? If not, I can't be that proud of the work that we've all done collectively, right? And so thinking about what are the goals that we'd like to see, just keep working on it. Let's bring more people together in this conversation because these are really big, difficult conversations and big, difficult problems because if they were easy, they'd be solved already, right? And, yeah, you know, the concept too about how we're really good at admiring a problem, but we're not the best at always solving them, right? I'd like to see less admiring and more rolling up our sleeves collectively, talking with folks who look different than us from different backgrounds to really try and solve these multifaceted problems and to see where we are at that point, to see who is brave to say and do the right thing because it's always difficult. I think it's what our parents taught us, right? The right thing is always difficult, you know? And so I, my, I would love to see us in a different place. I'd love to see medicine look different. I'd love to see it be more equitable. I would love to see it get to a place where we're, we're, we're just proud of the work that we've done. Can we take 2020 as a learning? Because there's lots of things for us to learn personally, professionally, societally. Did we take 2020 and learn? Or did we just take it and say later that's someone else's problem, right? I think that this can mean a lot of different things. But if we did learn and if we did do something about it, that would make me proud. I could probably go on and ask you questions because this is so fascinating for more time. But I want to be respectful of your time and thank you for joining us here today. Uh, Rachel, if people want to learn more about the Dime Society, follow up with any more questions. Um, and I'm hoping want to become members. Where should they go? Yeah, great. So um, thank you, first of all, for um, going along on this journey with me. We talk about uh, these really great things, and I appreciate another opportunity to, to talk about uh, what's important, and I'm pretty sure all of the people listening are also aligned on this. Um, but yeah, so if anyone is interested in Dime, um, great, thank you. Uh, very, very happy to have you aboard. So if anyone's interested in, again, the Digital Medicine Society, or Dime, Everyone is welcome to go to our website, that's www.dimesociety.org, and all our information is on there on how to join. Um, if you're still feeling us out, you don't want to have to make another login information, you can also access a lot of our information freely um, without becoming a member, but we do hope that you see value in us and want to help us change the future of healthcare together, where you're welcome to join. 
Great. And Rachel, with your permission, we'll go ahead and also we'll take your website and we'll link it on to our webpage at the digitalhealthcast.com. Uh, we'll also post it on uh, Twitter, on Instagram, and you know the link will be here on YouTube or you can find it on your favorite podcast player. Yeah. So again, that's the Digital Healthcast. Rachel, again, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been my pleasure speaking with you. Uh, stay safe, stay warm there in Chicago, and I hope to stay in contact. Awesome. Thanks, Moada. It's been a privilege to have a, to have a chat with you today, and I'm looking forward to seeing all the more episodes and fantastic guests that you'll have in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>